Hello everyone and welcome to the first installment of the Securing DevOps show and tell. Uh, I wanted to put this show together because there are a lot of people in this community who build and publish really awesome security tools uh, that we never hear of and that they don't get to present at conferences or when they do that don't necessarily get the attention they deserve. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks in various organizations rewrite, re-implement tools that exist in the open source community uh, that they could simply adopt and contribute to and make better for everyone. And so I thought it would be good to uh, go through some of these tools, to demo them, to put them in a format that you can consume at home without having to travel to a conference. And uh, then maybe you can decide to re-implement them, maybe you can decide to adopt them, maybe you can even join that community and write patches that everyone can use. Uh, so for this first installment, we talked to Scott Piper. Uh, Scott is uh, a security consultant and he's been an AWS security expert for the last few years. And he has written this tool called Cloud Mapper that helps you audit and visualize the state of your AWS account. And uh, Scott has been around for a while. He helped me uh, review and correct a number of technical issues in the first versions of Securing DevOps back when I was writing the book. Uh, you may remember him from his very excellent uh, weekly downhill infosec newsletter that sadly he no longer publishes but that's okay because he re reinvested all of that time into building awesome tools like cloud mapper but also the capture the flag challenge floss.cloud so scott presents a little bit of the work he's done around cloud mapper in this show we went in a pretty deep dive into what the tool can do how you can use it, how you can integrate it into your environment, how you can contribute to it even. And uh, we highlight some of the benefits of this approach and some of the other tools that can help you uh, achieve AWS security as well. I should mention that uh, this show isn't affiliated with or sponsored by anyone, uh, but if you are looking for someone who can help you bootstrap your AWS security effort, Scott is definitely someone you should talk to. All right, enjoy the demo. All right, so let, let's talk about this uh, this cloud mapper. Yeah, thing. all right. Should um, I? Yeah, you want to share your screen? So I, I, okay. I don't think we'd be able to see you yeah. and share the screen at the same time, but uh, demo, uh, I, I, have you given presentation? Like you can follow a pattern if you if you're I've never I've never really shown it before. So uh, okay. can just jump right in. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> let's jump right in. All right. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and so what I have here is basically just a like test account that, that I set up with. Um, and so once you've, once you've collected the information from an account, um, it, and then you basically run a command to prepare uh, this web page, it'll, then you load it in your web browser and then you're able to see this. Um, and so what you can see is uh, these different orange boxes here are different EC2 instances. Um, these ones that look a little different are gonna be auto scaling groups. Uh, these here are gonna be RDS instances. Uh, so, and then this, is, this whole box here is for one account. Um, and then it's showing the different regions. Uh, so there's not any like API calls going back or anything like that. Um, so everything's just static. So, so as an example, if we go to uh, like the homepage or the uh, GitHub page for it, and we look here at a demo, uh, you can see this is being hosted at github.io. Um, so this is just hosted. It's all just static files that are running up there. Got it. So at some point before you, you actually had that map generated, you had a an initialization step where it downloaded all of the yep. data from the AWS account and, yep. and messaged that into, into the graph we're looking at. Exactly, yeah. So um, let me just go back here to like the main page. And so getting this all set up um, on a Mac, you just run these commands here. So you, you clone the repo, um, do some brew install to get some of the uh, requirements for it. Um, or if you're on a Linux system, it gives instructions down here. Uh, but then the next steps is basically to use uh, pipenv in order to get your environment set up. So it'll um, download all of the Python libraries that are required. Um, so once you have all that set up, um, it comes with some demo data, so you can just run uh, this Python prepare step, which is going to take the demo data and convert that into a JSON file that will ultimately get loaded by the web server in order to display all the information there. Um, and then you run this web server command, which again is just that um, Python HTTP server command. Got it. And, and what's in that JSON file? Is it the yeah. like the, the the graph, the rendered graph, or yeah? So so all this is is it's basically identifying um, 
the the file let's see here i can actually open up a copy of it uh if i go to web and then data.json um so what it's doing is it's basically uh stating what the different nodes are and so it's giving them ids and like human readable names for them um, and so it's going to be this big long list of the nodes and then down here at the bottom somewhere um it'll then give me uh a similar format, but this is going to be for the edges. And so it'll say what the source is and what the target is um, there. And so if we go back here, so what it's really saying is like we have one node for the account, and then uh, we have another node here for the region within the account, um, another node for the VPC, another node for the availability zone, another node for the subnet, and then nodes for each of the EC2s or other network resources that exist within those subnets. Um, and then there's going to be nodes that are acting as edges um, which specify that you know this here is connected to these nodes here got it so, yeah um and so yeah so so what i'm using behind the scenes is cytoscape js uh which is somewhat similar to like graph biz or something like that so it's a it's a library that is going to display these things and so what i chose i chose to use graph uh cytoscape js so that i could see it all in the browser and actually be able to interact with it because graph biz uh is normally meant for more of just displaying things in a static image file so you know you basically will run graph biz and output a png or something like that um where as I wanted it to actually be interactive so you could click on things um, and be able to get more information about them. So up here in the top right hand corner, this shows me like some details about this node. Uh, it'll list who the different neighbors are, the siblings, um, any children it has. So as an example, like this will be a little bit more interesting. This is a subnet. And so it's saying that there's three children in the subnet, which are each going to be these EC2 instances. Got it. That's yeah. that's super cool. So you can actually it's basically a better a better map of your AWS account with all the details accessible <clears throat> right away. Yeah. So that, I mean that was that was the original goal was basically, you know, I I do assessments for companies and companies themselves, you know, also have this interest of, you know, they they might have a focus on like their main production account. And then there's all these developer accounts or, you know, like uh, just some other random accounts at the company, or maybe they do um, an acquisition. And so suddenly they need to wrap their heads around, you know, like, okay, what is this new acquisition doing? Um, you know, how are they using their AWS accounts? And so the initial goal was in order to be able to show um, this map, uh, you know, a, a network diagram diagram of what the account looks like. And, and so it's not only identifying all the different resources in the account and like the, the hierarchies of where those resources exist within the different regions and VPCs, uh, but then it's also getting all these different edges. And so in order to calculate those edges, what I do is I look at the security groups in order to understand basically what can talk to what. Um, so so some people will use things like VPC flow logs on AWS in order to um, look at a record of what has spoken to what. Um, whereas I wanted to look at the actual, like basically firewall settings or the security groups in order to see what is capable of talking to what. Uh, because especially from like a security perspective, that can sometimes be more interesting, you know, cause suddenly you realize like, oh, this thing is publicly accessible to the internet or, hey, I had an assumption that, you know, these were more segmented than they actually are. Yeah, that's right. And and we've had the same discussions internally as well. Like, should we audit our VPC flow logs? At the end of the day, you audit the security group because you want to know what's actually permitted, not yeah. what is happening in the network. Exactly. Um, it was, so would you use this tool uh, kind of like to start an assessment? Like you're entering a world, you don't know anything about the account. And like you said, like you want to know what's happening in this, in this new environment. Or yeah. would you use that like regularly to audit change over time? Um, so, so unfortunately, when you first, uh, like, run and have this all displayed, it ends up looking like this kind of gobbledygook where, you know, it's not, it's not really uh, being displayed in the way that you might want to, you know, because you might say like, oh, I want, you know, uh, the public internet to, you know, that node to be over here. And I want to see um, this node down here or this uh, region over here. And, you know, you'll, you'll want to organize things in different ways, um, you know, manually moving these things around in order for it to make more sense. And, you know, even in this network here, you can see it's really confusing, uh, you know, because there's just all these different edges pointing everywhere. Um, these are just some like random cloud formation templates that I found online and spun up just so I could get some data here for a demo environment. Um, but because, be, because 
you have to manually move things around, it ends up not being something, you know, like I've had people request like, hey, could we just run this, you know, as a dashboard in our, you know, knock or something like that. Um, and, and so as, you know, things change automatically, you know, new nodes would be added. And it's really not something that this is built for because every time you generate this image, it ends up being like randomly generated in these weird ways that you're ultimately going to want to manually move things around in order to make them more understandable and readable to you. So, so kind of the initial goal with it was just to give you like, okay, let's, let's put all the nodes and put them how they're, you know, what the actual hierarchies are and where they're located within different subnets. And let's put the edges on there and allow, you know, people to manually go in and massage it into a way that, you know, is more visually appealing for themselves, you know, cause you can also go ahead and you can say, okay, I don't actually, you know, care about um, that you know, VPC at all. So let me just remove that one there. Um, and, you know, I don't care about this one. So, and you'll know, be able to simplify your diagram to only the aspects of the project that you actually care about. Um, and so, so it gives you those capabilities to do that. Um, or I can go ahead here and let's see if I can try and, uh, you know, minimize some of these things. So I'll minimize, um, let's see this as well. Um, so now, you know, you can, more you can focus more in on just the aspects of your environment that you care about because chances are your environment has a whole bunch of different you know products or services all running out of it um you know or at one time you might only care about one you know data flow or something like that so you can try and narrow in better on it oh man the the, the graph itself is like pure catnip for security people just just mm -hmm. moving boxes around and adding yep. and moving <laughs> stuff. I, just, I can spend hours just doing that in a yep. big graph um, yeah and one of one of the difficulties, though, with it, unfortunately, is you know as you saw this you know original node uh, or graph you know only had you know like twenty different nodes in it or something like that, and it already looked kind of like a jumble. And so when you get in environments, like especially larger environments where there's maybe like two thousand you know EC two instances or other resources, it just looks like a complete spider web and rat's nest. And and so that was kind of a realization for me, you know, and, and you you have this problem with like a lot of tools is when you use it only as a small data set, it looks awesome. It looks amazing. You know, it's like, it, it's super easy to use. But then when you put it in like an actual scaled environment, it becomes so much, you know, it, it, it becomes a lot more difficult to try and understand. And I mean, part of that is just the nature of that environment. Like if you have 2000 EC2 nodes and if they're all doing different types of applications on them, like that's a complex environment, you know, no matter how you try and visualize it, it's going to be difficult to understand. Um, and so, so what I've also tried to build into cloud mapper is like a various like filtering functionality. So when you generate this graph, you can narrow in on like specific uh, regions or VPCs so that you're not having to deal with your entire network at one time. So when you, when you're on the command line, if you just want mm -hmm. that VPC with the three EC2 instances, you can just give yep. it a flag. Exactly, and, and right away would you would generate a reduced graph. Yep. So so I can switch over here to um, the command line view here, and and so just to give you like an understanding of the the flow of things is when you when you first do that initial setup where you know you run pip env and you brew install different things, um, what you're going to have to do is uh, modify this um, config file here. Let me uh, cd back up. Make sure I'm in the right place. Okay. Um, so you'll modify this config file and all this is doing is basically saying like here's my accounts here's what the id for the account is and the name of the account that i want to use for it um, and then you can also specify in here like different cider ranges that you might have um, and so these are useful for your security groups so that um, instead of just giving you like hey here's this random ip address that was found in um, in one of your security groups it'll specify like this is your san francisco office or new york office or something like that so it'll simplify that graph um, and if i look here here um, on the demo, I'm making use of that functionality. Uh, and this comes up here. Yeah, so you can see here, like here's the right. San Francisco office and New York office. Um, so it makes it a little bit more understandable for you if you've uh, given trust to certain IP ranges. Um, so you set up that configuration file, and then what you'll do is you'll run uh, Python Cloud Mapper Collect and the account name test and uh, what this will end up doing is it down it basically runs a whole bunch of different describe and list calls and then downloads those all to local files that are that are cached essentially in here um, so that in later commands you're not con you know continuously banging up against those apis because especially um 
as you make more API calls and with larger accounts, you'll realize like AWS's API calls, you know, for list and describe are actually pretty slow. And you can also bump into rate limiting issues where, you know, they'll, they'll basically, uh, you know, give you an error of a rate limit. And uh, this can become, can become really problematic in some people's production environments if they haven't accounted for the possibility of those errors. Um, I, this unfortunately happened in, in one environment that I worked in where, um, it, I was running a whole bunch of describe calls and it ended up rate limiting me. And when AWS rate limits you, it doesn't rate limit your specific user or your specific IP address. It rate limits your entire AWS account for that call. Um, and so what had happened was, is it rate limited me and it rate limited the entire account. And there was another application running in that account and uh, it did not account for rate limiting as a possibility because they'd never bumped into it before. And so it ended up receiving errors and uh, caused some, you know, minor inconvenience for them in that account. So, so that's something I'm always uh, very worried about. Like people ask me sometimes like, Hey, you know, this collect command, it's kind of slow, you know, could, could you like parallel, you know, run everything in parallel. So it downloads it all at once. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to ever run into that rate limiting issue again, you know? So, um, so I, I try we, to avoid Yeah. That. We've made that mistake too. We've, we've, we had an application that, that manages bot instances. I think it does a bunch of describe instance calls and run into the rate limit. And what's interesting about about the rate limit is that this is one of the few limit that AWS doesn't let you increase, right? Yeah, so you can't yeah. just send a support ticket and say, give me more. Yep. That, that doesn't work for this one. It's like, no, no, your heart. You just have to slow move. yourself down. Yeah, which exactly. is super frustrating. Um, so yeah, so, you know, both both myself with this tool and what you'll see with a lot of other tools like Security Monkey and other tools is they all cache the data locally. So they're not repeatedly making those requests. Um, and so what I can see is... Uh, and that's basically the, the JSON response from the API code, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So if I go in here and uh, look at this test, um, I'll just show you. It's, it's basically uh, for this account, it'll then create directories for each of the different regions. Um, so then if I look in US East 1, um, it can, you can see here all these JSON files for every single one of the different API calls that I make. Um, and and this and it'll do uh, like paging and stuff like that. So if there's you know um, you know a hundred thousand different uh, responses, you know, or hundred thousand different EC2 instances, for example, um, with AWS, you have to repeatedly make a call to them, um, an API call to basically you know say like, hey, give me the first one hundred, give me the next one hundred, etc. And so Cloud Mapper takes care of all that for you behind the scenes, um, and it does it actually in a pretty cool way. If I look at the collect um, the collect commands here. Uh, I've totally abstracted everything out. So if you want to add in, you know, your own um, API call that you want to request that data for, all you have to do is add it to this file and then it'll automatically, you know, collect that data for you. So you don't have to, you know, write a whole bunch of code or anything like that in order to do it. Um, so if I look at, for example, the service STS, get caller identity, um, I can go ahead and look here. There's going to be this STS get caller identity file. And if I go and cat that file, you can see it's the exact JSON response that I would get back if I made that request call. Um, and then there's some calls that uh, require different parameters. And so with this, I have kind of a cool way of doing it where, um, you know, I have uh, for IAM, if I want to make a get role call, you have to specify the role name that you want. And so as a value to that get role name, what I do is I basically make a JQ query against one of the previously collected files. So it'll go ahead and look in this IAM get account authorization, authorization details file, and it'll make this JQ query to get the role detail list and the role name. And then if I go ahead and I look, um, so folks, if you want to know how to make JQ query and you can't figure it out like the rest of us, you can just email Scott and we'll answer <laughs> <Yeah>. your question. <laughs> They're pretty hard to write, right? Yep. Um, yeah. yeah, so so if I look here, this um, it then creates a directory and then each one of the parameters that it made calls with, it creates files for each of those parameters. So I can look here, this trailblazer, and it's giving me all the information about that role in there. Um, so yeah, so the collection of data is, is super easy and, and the end result of all this is it's caching it all locally for you. So you have a local cache of all these different um, API calls and, uh, you know, as JSON files on disk. Um, so have you, uh, since you have a copy of everything and yeah. particularly a copy of the graph itself, yep. um, I imagine you've tried at some point do a diff between 
two runs of the tool to see what changed between the two. Like it was every way. Super cool feature. Show yeah. me an, uh, an actual diagram of what was added or removed between two runs. I, I haven't done that. Um, and, you know, part of that is just I, I'm normally coming in and doing these assessments, you know, for, for a one time thing. And I haven't had the chance, uh, you know, to to see what has changed in the environment over time. Uh, but in theory, it should be possible. And And one of the one of the like kind of additional goals that I've kind of had with this collect command is if you want a copy of the metadata of your entire AWS account, kind of my goal has been to make that collect query accomplish that for you. Uh, because AWS config is AWS service that's supposed to perform that for you. And AWS config, uh, you know, only works with, I, I did the stats recently, and it's only like 20% of the AWS services or resource types that it actually collects the data for. And so examples of things that AWS config does not collect the information for is going to be route 53, um, or API gateway. And so, so a lot of these different AWS services that are pretty widely used and you want to have some type of copy for, you know, for disaster recovery purposes in case, you know, your entire account gets, you know, deleted by, you know, an attacker or something like that. You want to have that copy so that you can recreate it, you know, recreate everything. Um, and so, so the collect command, you know, helps gather all that metadata for you so that you have a local copy. If you ever do need to kind of see a point in time or something like that, um, you know, it's, there are benefits of AWS config, but there's going to be benefits of having your own copy as well and, and being able to, you know, specifically specify what are the APIs that you want copies of. Well, a lot of people, like in theory, you're supposed to control the entire AWS environment through a like, cloud formation and maybe something like Ansible or something like that to, exactly. to generate everything. But in in, in the in reality, practice. in the real world, right? <laughs> yep. People do like 80% of the stuff uh, through mm -hmm. cloud formation and, and Ansible and whatnot. And then they go into the console and they create the stuff that's super yep. hard to script by hand. Exactly. Right, so. and, and it's, yeah, it, it, you know, you, if it's something that you're only doing once, you know, and never doing again, then like, does it really make that much sense to figure out how to, you know, create it as infrastructure as code, like in an ideal world? Yes. But in reality, it, it's, it just can be more time consuming, you know, and, and so this also just helps ensure that you have all those perhaps additional resources that someone might have created, you know, because, because also there's a problem with some of the infrastructure as code tools of trying to identify, um, what resources have been created outside of that tool, you know, so if you're using Terraform for everything and someone creates something by not using Terraform, you know, can you then figure out how to get that back into your own scripts? And so even identifying that those exist can sometimes be problematic in some of these tools um, for some of the services that exist out there. Yeah, that's very true. So yeah, it's good to have a copy for sure. Yeah. Um, could you go back to the, uh, so I think on the readme, you have the instructions yeah. on how to run this, because most people will look at this and they'll mm -hmm. run it with their fully privileged administrator account, which is yep. <laughs> pretty terrible, but that's uh, what we all do. The exactly. Yep. And you have a role to do that with minimal privileges, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I do specify, um, I basically say to use security audit and the view only access, and then there's some additional privileges here. Um, so in a perfect world, like AWS's security audit uh, managed policy would be kept up to date with all the different AWS services that get released. Uh, but unfortunately, the security audit um, role is oftentimes very far behind, um, as is the view only access. And so because of that, I have to specify, you know, all these additional um, things that, that I might want access to. And, uh, and some of these, and, and I'll admit, not all of these are currently being used by Cloud Mapper to collect all this information. Um, but all of these should be different. Uh, it, it, it should only be things that are metadata related. So it's not going to be any, uh, if you create a role that has these privileges, they cannot change anything in your account and nor can they exfil any information, you know, or any of the data in the account. So it gives you access to see the S3 buckets that exist and, um, and be able to see the policies associated with those S3 buckets, but it doesn't give you the privileges to, you know, collect the objects that are in those S3 buckets. Um, so it somewhat yeah. reduces the danger if this role was somehow compromised. And that's that's a question that always comes back. Like when you when you create, you you do your first audit, right? You don't necessarily know the ops team running the account, and you go to them and you say, "Hey, could I have 
these policies attached to my account, they look at it like, what? Yep. <laughs> You're literally touching everything. There's no way we're giving you that many. But no, these policies exactly. are designed like Security Monkeys as uh, one as well. They're mm. designed to not give you access to any data or anything sensitive. It's all describe roles. And exactly. even I think like the, those describe roles, they, they leak metadata, which, you know, potentially is security sensitive, but nothing yeah. like no access keys, no exactly. uh, database structure, not even like the content of an RDS database or, yep. or um, a Dynamo DB or anything like that, so it's it's pretty safe to run. Yeah, and and the other like reason for creating Cloud Mapper was people were worried about giving these different SaaS solutions, you know, all these different types of accesses into their account, um, and so so that was a reason why you know companies wanted like a locally run version, you know, especially for myself, I wanted to, you know, be able to do these types of activities on my own without having to use some type of SaaS solution, and you know. You know, basically give that those you know companies or those vendors all of this data. You know, be able to keep it local, um, and so that that's another benefit of this tool as well. Can you do any sort of um, IM auditing with Cloud Mapper today, like looking at yeah. um, you know who has access to? Uh, yep. certain resources or things like that uh sort of so so let me let me go ahead and show you like uh so cloud mapper um originally its original purpose was just in order to create those network diagrams and then i ended up um, running into situations where you know i had to basically audit like a large number of accounts so i had to audit over 100 accounts for one company and there weren't any tools that could really do that type of audit at that large a scale but i knew that cloud mapper had the ability to easily collect the metadata and then once i had that metadata you know i could go ahead and i could run you know these cat commands across like all the different um data that was collected and do JQ, JQ queries across it locally. Um, so I knew I had the ability to do it. So I started adding um, additional functionality to Cloud Mapper. So if I just run Cloud Mapper, um, you can see there's there's some additional uh, commands that I can run instead of uh, just running like a web server and uh, preparing um, that network diagram. So as an example here, I should have an audit command and account test. Um, and so this just really quickly, it says like, hey, there's an internet accessible S3 bucket um, via policy. And it tells me like what that S3 bucket is. It tells me there's no password policy set. Um, it tells me, it looks at the um, IEM get credentials and it tells me that there's these users here that have access keys that have never used them before. Um, it tells me that uh, S3 control access block, which is a new service that AWS just announced in November, um, is not configured uh, for the account. And so what this does is it basically allows you to ensure that an account cannot make um, S3 buckets public, um, or if any are attempted to be made public, that, that it won't be accessible publicly. Um, so it does that. It tells me guard duty is um, only turned on um, for some of the different regions, not all of the regions. Um, and then it tells me some other best practice information like these RDS instances have public IP addresses. Um, they're not publicly accessible, but they do have the a public IP address, which is uh, you know frowned upon uh, because you're only one step away from making those RDSs actually publicly accessible. And uh, RDS instances don't stand up well against like brute force um, uh, attacks against their authentication. Um, so it does these checks and like a whole bunch of other checks as well. So it's really trying to accomplish, you know, I figured like I already have all the metadata about the account. Um, there's no sense in me like gathering the metadata in order to run Cloud Mapper and then additionally trying to run, you know, Security Monkey and Prowler and some of the other tools that exist out there. Like I can do it all within Cloud Mapper because it has all the data itself. Um, so, so it has that command for it. Uh, I also have a command. Can, can you, before you move on to the yeah. to the editing stuff, I think that's super interesting for people mm -hmm. to write their own policy. Like we we actually grew our own tool to do this type of test. How do you write a new test to say, for example, I want to say that uh, I don't want to allow any unused yep. keys for like thirty days or like sixty yeah. days or something like this? Yep. Let me let me see here. Uh, so if I look in commands in audit. Um, so it's all it Python. One? Yeah. So it's all Python code in here, and so. Basically, I, I make a query in order to try and um, figure out what my account ID is here. And so this is for the S3 block, this, this new um, 
uh, service that exists. And so then I look basically for that API. And so ultimately these two queries here, I end up getting the JSON data that was uh, returned when I made that API request. And so then I just put some checks in here um, in order to say, you know, okay, if that, if that file doesn't exist, then it means S3 control access block is not on. Um, otherwise, you know, let me go ahead and check through it for some of the different, um, you know, configurations that are important in there. All right, so that's thin line of code to add a test, right? It's pretty minimal. Yeah. It takes yep. a few minutes to write, and and yeah, so it's pretty easy. Like, uh, I I always try to frame things in for you know people who are starting uh, yeah. in a new company that have to implement like, hey, I'm in charge of AWS security now. Where do yeah. I start? Like, you can start with something like this to get an idea of um, how your account is doing, and you can start writing some tests. Mm -hmm. uh, they want some basic stuff. That you never want to see happen, like your databases being open to the public yep. that are specific to your organization and that can run forever mm -hmm. uh, to test that things never regress. Yep. Yeah. And so, so my hope is is that eventually, instead of just doing print statements here, I output it in some type of format that could be pulled into another tool. You know, so maybe you run uh, Cloud Mapper's audit command, and then for all the different items that get audit, you know, output, then you know you could run that into some type of tool that's going to send those as Slack messages or something like that. So if you're you know regularly running Cloud Mapper's collect command, you know, like every week or something like that, and then you know basically have it act in a similar way as Security Monkey does. Um, so that's you know hopefully. Hopefully at some point down the road, I have the time in order to do that. But for right now, you just have to manually run these things. Awesome. Yeah. What else can you do? Uh, <laughs> so let me go here and run uh, this find admins command. Um, so this one does print some of the information in JSON. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so it is outputting this to the, basically the JSON to standard error. And then this text down here goes to standard out. Um, and so this find admins command is finding all the administrators in the account, whether they're users or roles. Um, and then additionally, we'll look to see if there's any, um, it, it'll look, it'll tell you the admins that are not only admins based on the fact that they have the administrative access policy associated with them, but also anybody that has um, privilege escalation abilities. And it does this in kind of a dumb way. It basically just says like, do they have the ability to modify IEM in some way? So can they you know, create a new user and attach a policy to them and do things like that? Um, so it'll identify people that you're gonna wanna look at you know, more closely. And so if we look at, um, let me see if I can, and make the text a little easier for you to read. Um, so if we if we look at uh, the information that's spit out here to the standard error, this JSON information, it's saying that you know there's a custom policy that's allowing admin. Um, and the way that it's doing this is basically it has this IAM star privilege within that policy. Um, so it's it's unfortunately not pretty printed there, um, but it does allow you to you know kind of identify some of these things. Um, we have another uh, issue here. Um, and I, I give like a severity to it. And so I say, this is kind of a warning and saying there's a group that's admin, but the name does not indicate that it is. And I do this in a dumb way by just seeing like, does the name um, have the word admin in it? And so in this case, the group is called God. And so this is my admin group for, for the account. Um, but, but because it's not called admin, it's just calling that out for me. Because I, I see that a lot of times in a lot of different people's account where, you know, it might just be called like test employees or something like that. And it's like, why does that have, you know, admin privileges associated with it. Um, so, so I see that pretty often. This will also look at things like what is the principle that's associated um, with that uh, role. So if you have, for example, in uh, a role that is um, supposed to be applied to EC2 instances, and that has administrative privileges, that will end up showing up here as like a warning or something um, in order to tell you like, hey, you have an EC2 instance role that is granted, you know, admin privileges, because ideally you don't want compute resources to have admin privileges. You want to only have your, you know, actual human users in the account um, be admins within the account. Well, and your Jenkins server that's open to the internet. Of course, yeah. <laughs> there, there are needs, so. Yeah. Um, Good. Yeah, so I've got that command. Um, let's see what else is there. Yeah. Oh, should, should I do this one here? Um, this one's gonna be kind of boring uh, for this account. Yeah, so this is uh, short for Web of Trust. Um, oh. Was that what I decided to um, call it? <laughs> and so it's gonna end up giving like a very similar um, view as that network diagram. Uh, but in this case, what it's doing is uh, 
this this is the view that it'll show you ultimately when when you bring it up. Um, and what it's doing is it's showing okay, this is your AWS account, and then this is an unknown account um, that has some type of trust into that account. And so because this is such a small account, it's not very exciting. Um, but you know when you run this on you know an environment that has twenty accounts, um, and that's that's one of the benefits of Cloud Mapper is, is most of the commands all work with multiple accounts at the same time. Um, and so you can then generate this diagram of all of those you know, 20 accounts, and you'll see all the different vendor associations that are uh, you know, given access. So you know, you'll see things like Cloud Checker or you know, Datadog or something like that that have been given some type of IEM role. And so, so I, have, I keep, tri uh, keep track of a list of all of the AWS accounts um, that, that I've uh, you know, somehow figured out, you know, whether it's, you know, seeing them perhaps in, in, um, you know, a client's uh, environment or, you know, seeing something publicly written online. But basically, uh, if I go here and uh, look in um, my GitHub, vendoraccounts.yaml, um, this shows me all the different uh, account IDs that are associated with some of the different uh, vendors out there for the, for the cloud. And so this all is right, because they publish them, right? I mean, they they, they, yeah. they say, if you want to integrate with us, this is the account you need to also exactly. write, so you can, yeah. you can map them directly. That's really cool. Yep. And so I keep track of like the source, like what web page was telling me that, you know, this is, uh, you know, publicly public knowledge that, you know, segment IO has this, you know, account ID. Um, so, so yeah, so it helps you very quickly see, you know, not only what are the different vendors, but then also how are your own accounts um, trusted between each other, you know, because you'll oftentimes have like a single identity account um, right. that has IEM roles into all of your other accounts. And so very quickly you can see because it'll have, you know, basically, um, you know, this uh, like hub and spoke uh, model where, you know, you have this one account that has all these different ties into all of your other accounts, you know, and you'll, and it not only, I mean, let me go well, so I explained for people who are not familiar with this, like the way that like, big organizations usually manage their AWS accounts is that an AWS account will be dedicated to like one application or one type of application. Yeah. And on top of all of these, you'll have a master identity account that has all of your users. And when you connect, when you create a session, you do that with your MFA in that identity account, then you yeah. go assume a role in the target account to do your operations, right? Exactly. So you end up having this web of like this tree essentially this hierarchy mm -hmm. of, of uh, role assumptions across the entire environment of accounts that can get messy pretty quickly if you have like 20 30 or 40 accounts Exactly. So, so I created um, this web of trust command in order to be able to see not only the different IEM trust that exists, um, which if it's only a read-only trust, I show it with a gray line, but if it's like an admin trust, so you're allowed to assume a role that has admin privileges, then I show it as a red line. Um, and then if it's just S3 buckets that are trusted, um, so based on the access policy, the S3 bucket, uh, then I show it as like a yellow line. If it's a VPC peering, then I show it as a blue line. Um, and so, so it helps you you quickly see like what are the different trusts and connections between all of your different AWS accounts because as companies create more and more accounts and they create all these weird trusts between them then then it becomes you know more and more important and, and so this helped me find for example um, you know found found an account that uh, basically had this uh, cycle of admin trust in it that they didn't realize was happening. You know, they thought that, you know, this one account of theirs was, you know, fairly isolated and only this one other account had privileges in order to access it. But because that other account had, um, basically trust grants on it for other accounts, it then allowed, you know, all these other accounts in order to, if, if an attacker figured out how to move laterally between AWS accounts, they could move into this one account and then finally into that one account that they thought was well protected. So instead of granting trust to only a single account, it was actually granting trust to, you know, about a dozen AWS accounts. Yep, this is lateral movement in the world of cloud. You no longer mm -hmm. create connections between servers, you create uh, role assumptions between accounts. Exactly. Yeah, this is really cool. Yeah. So let's see here. Go so ahead. what's next for for the tool? Like, what else? What else do you have planned for it? Uh. So yeah. So I can actually show you um some uh, some of the like private commands that I haven't actually released yet that I plan on uh, releasing here soon. Um, so I have this dashboard command, um, which will give me like a really quick understanding of an account. Um, so I think I have it. 
as one of these here. Yeah, so what this does is um, if you run this across all of your different accounts, um, it'll show you the resource counts. Um, and so what this will do, you know, here you can see, okay, here are the number of S3 buckets and EC2 instances. And so it creates this bar graph. And what you'll find a lot for a lot of different companies is they will have, you know, like maybe they have a dozen AWS accounts, but only one account is like maybe their production account that has just everything in it. And so it very quickly allows you to see like what are the accounts that are actually, you know, have a lot of different things in it, you know, or maybe you see one account has a ton of EC2 instances and another account is using tons of lambdas or something. And so that helps you understand, like, how are the different accounts being used from that resource level view? Um, so I'm going to focus on the one that has all the KMS keys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where I want to go. <laughs> yep. Um, and so, so yeah, so then it's able to show you here. Um, it's just, again, it's just showing the exact same thing, but sometimes this is an easier view. If I look at this table here, um, where it'll show me, you know, you'll, you'll basically be able to narrow in on what are the accounts that have a whole bunch of green boxes, you know, or you'll see, you know, all of your accounts have green boxes for, um, you know, or have white boxes here because they have zero ELBs in them. And then you'll have a single account that has an ELB. And so you might want to, you know, investigate, like, why are they using ELBs and nobody else is or whatever the resource happens to be. Um, and then it also shows you by region. Um, and so this is, you know, also, you know, confusing for a lot of people is like your different views in the AWS console are restricted by region. And so you might have a whole bunch of EC2s running in an account, but if you're not in the right region for it, then you might not see those. Um, I guess AWS has changed for the EC2 role uh, view that recently, but, but some of the other services don't give you that whole global view of things. Um, and so this will help me see like, what are the different uh, regions that are actually being used? And if I scroll over them, I can see like this has a random KMS key in it. And so I'm going to want to investigate like why, why is this uh, region only have a KMS key and no other resources in it? Um, so, you know, that's something to look at. And then this is really cool. Um, so AWS recently um, released this Access Advisor um, APIs. And so what that allows you to do is it previously was only visible within the uh, web um, interface. And so you'd have to log in and look at Access Advisor and uh, identify what are your inactive roles, you know, like what which roles haven't you know used any of their capabilities for a long time. And uh, so now they have an API for this. And so now what this command does is uh, it generates this chart for you. And so for, for each account, it'll generate um, this like group, I think, I think the proper term for it is like a grouped bar chart. Um, and so what it'll do is it'll have one, uh, one row is going to be for the users and another row is going to be for the roles. And um, it'll show you how many of those users are active and how many are inactive and then how many roles are um, active versus inactive. And so again, this really helps you narrow in on like, what are my problem accounts that perhaps have roles that haven't been used in 90 days? Um, and you might have like one account that just has tons of roles or something in it or you know, tons of users that need to be cleaned up. So ideally, you should only see blue and green here. Yeah, I started noticing that in a lot of the stuff that we do that people tend to request accounts before they have an actual need for it. And so because they think they're going to start a project that's going to use that account and something. And when we often find accounts that were created that have privileges that were never used. Yep, exactly. Right? And yep. and so you need a tool to go through them and list them and review whether the access is still needed or not. And the other yep. case is like, um, people who've been at a company for long enough will have permissions all over the place and mm -hmm. they've moved roles over time and they no longer exercise those permissions. They should just be removed from the yep. account. So you need a way to audit that. And that's, that's one of the, of the way to do it, which is really cool. Super yep. cool. Um, and then down here, uh, what I do is when I use that graph view and I'm able to see what are the EC2s and other resources that are public, the different network resources, um, I then just show counts here. So uh, so you'll be able to see like, okay, I have two EC2 instances that are public and, are, uh, and an auto scaling group and API gateway that is public there. So publicly accessible from the internet. Um, and then I also look at the port ranges that are associated with those and show how many are here. And so what you'll see in a lot of accounts is, you know, for example, here, there's this one resource that has uh, three, three, uh, 3306 open in addition to port 22 SSH. And so 3306 is going to be my SQL. And so you're going to be like, hey, why is there, you know, uh you know, an EC2 instance or something that's running um, that has, you know, the MySQL port accessible to the internet. And so this again will just kind of help you see uh, like what what is the port ranges, you know, that, that are accessible from the internet. It helps you narrow in on perhaps, you know, problematic things, you know, or it just helps you see like, hey, it looks like 
they're allowing port 22 access for a lot of different resources. And, uh, you know, for your environment, you might say like, hey, we should just have a single bastion host and not have all different EC2 instances accessible on, on SSH like that. So, so yeah, so this is the new dashboard command that hopefully um, will get released here soon. Uh, but it just kind of gives you a whole bunch of these different different views of the resources to help you narrow in on perhaps problematic things or or just give you a better understanding of these accounts. And, and for me, it's really helpful, you know, when I want to suddenly, you know, jump into a company and figure out what's going on, it helps me narrow in on things like that. Yeah, and I think it's really, really critical for any you know, operation security team to have these tools handy. Like yeah. we, we underestimate the value of doing like six months or yearly reviews mm -hmm. of, of the stuff that we manage day to day because it's a lot of work and it's not always fun, right? Yep. You're gonna spend two or three days digging through that data and you've done it six months ago and it's probably fine. But yep. every time we've done that work manually, we found things that exactly. need to be cleaned up, need to be removed. So super yep. useful data. Um, and then the other new command that I have is, uh, Again, using um, that access advisor command, um, what I am able to do is I'm able to see for each of the different users and roles uh, what privileges they've actually been granted versus what privileges that they've actually used. And so, so if I click on one of these here, um, this user auditor, you can see that it's it's never actually used certificate manager, um, and it tells me the the number of days since that was used, and then it also tells me the source of that privilege. Um, so it's going to be the policy that is actually associated associated with that user. And so that that also is, you know, useful because a lot of times or sometimes you might be like, hey, this user, you know, maybe you're looking in CloudTrail logs or something and you see that this user used this API and you were like, I didn't think they had, you know, the ability to use that API. And then you have to track down like, okay, which which groups are they associated with? What inline policies do they have? What managed policies do they have? And what managed policies do those different groups have associated with them? And you have to try and track it down. And so this this is just to try and help you uh, more quickly identify where those are coming from. Um, What's the period of time that it uses to decide that uh, a, a permission has never been used? Um, so so this is actually so in this case, um, Access Advisor basically just. Uh, it, it'll say um, when it has just like a, a dash here, um, that's because Access Advisor has no knowledge of that ever being used. And so I'm not sure what that date would be. It's probably like back in like uh, 2014 or something like that maybe is when Access Advisor was first released. Um, so he never, so, he never did his data, right? You get, my yeah. point is like if it's a 30 day or 90 days window, you might have yeah. you know a role being executed like once a year. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't show up in here. Exactly. Yeah. So th that will show up here and it'll, it'll give, um, it'll show up in red, but it will, uh, it'll say like, you know, 300 and, you know, 60 days ago or 300 days yeah. ago or something like that was the last time that it was used. Um, and it'll still show up as red. And so, so I do with this command, um, right now I'm just calling it these probes and I do have like a max age, which is set by set as 90 as the default and otherwise you know if you want to be really aggressive and say you know i want to see anybody that hasn't used it in 30 days or something like that you know you you can specify it there so the next killer feature for this feature mm -hmm. request please like yeah. just just output a patch out of this <laughs> <laughs> that's just... that's the hope yeah one one day i'll get to that point um because yeah what, what this also allows me to do is uh it just allows me to see like what are the different policies here and so the whole purpose behind this is to kind of wrap your head around the iam um that's being used in an account more easily and be able to quickly you know look through what's going on because if you try and do it through web ui that's you know cumbersome and when you try and do it you know through aws's web ui and if you try and do it through um the api calls that's a, a, even more of a nightmare to try and um, get this information out so that that's the purpose behind this command is to more easily see this information um, and then i also um i create a graph of basically the roles and the different um iem policies that are associated with them and, and so again unfortunately you know cytoscape doesn't do a very good job of laying this information out all the time um, but it's able to see like this user here is associated with this group and they have these different policies associated with that group um, so it can help you you know find outliers more quickly where you know it's a single user that's not associated with certain groups um, or, or different issues like that so um, and then again, it also tells you like, what are the different inactive principles? Um, and I give it, you know, kind of different icons to indicate whether or not it's a user or a role here. Awesome. I, I was, okay. So originally it was like, 
Yeah, Cloud Mapper, you know, we need 20, 30 minutes to go through this tool, but we added <laughs> so many features, it's impressive. I, I'm really yeah. impressed. Yeah. Um, yeah, Cloud Mapper has, uh, it, a lot of people are only familiar with it as being like this network diagramming tool. And it's like kind of frustrating to me when like they say that because it's like, no, it does so much more. Like it is a tool to do like everything that like all these other security tools are doing. And so I'm, I'm awesome. constantly, you know, trying to add to it and update it, you know, add these new services and, you know, fill out these different uh, commands to, to just give more and more functionality to it. Um, which unfortunately probably, you know, results in weird states sometimes where, you know, um, I haven't uh, as well tested things as hopefully I should have, you know, um, but, but I am, you know, continuously building on it. So I have never pushed a broken release. Yeah. That's never happened to me. <laughs> yeah, you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Wait, have you managed to get like contributors? Because I know it's an open source project, right? Yeah. It's under yeah. the Duo accounts yeah. and yeah, yeah, do people help? Definitely, um, which has been like amazing to me. Um, like there's 34 contributors uh, so far. Um, I guess I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that this has been the first project that like has actually been popular that I've done before. <laughs> you know, like I've, I've created like a number of, you know, open source tools and uh, not a lot of people have really, you know, been that interested in them. Whereas this one, like in the first like few days or month, it had like a thousand stars on GitHub and like now it has over 2000 stars. And so, you know, it keeps climbing. Uh, my goal has been to have it be the most popular uh, cloud security project by stars on GitHub. So currently I think only um, Security Monkey is beating me. So I'm hoping I can beat them, uh, you know, pretty soon here, especially because uh, unfortunately Security Monkey has been sunset. Um, so they're not, you know, actively developing it anymore. Um, and so unfortunately that is going to be the cause to allow me to, you know, get ahead of them <laughs> because it's not being as, uh, you know, actively developed anymore with new features. Well, they moved to uh, to RepoKit, right? That's what they invest their so, resources now. Yeah, so they they have a couple different tools. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't want to speak too much uh, for the Netflix guys, but, but yeah, so they have a tool called RepoKit, um, which is doing the same type of IM activities as I just showed with that least privileged man, um, and it is automatically uh, you know repoing or removing privileges that people aren't using. Um, so it's only doing that. Where Security Monkey is able to detect public S3 buckets and different things like that. Um, so that that was, you know, kind of what the different differentiator between those two things was, is RepoKit is solely focused on IAM, and then um, Security Monkey is focused on just general assessment of an AWS account. Um, but yes, yeah, so they're, they're moving to, and I guess they, they haven't announced what their, you know, new way of doing things will be. Uh, but yeah, hopefully they'll, they'll come out with something. Always good stuff coming from those guys. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right. Uh, well, anything else you want to uh, leave the audience with on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, I think another valuable um, takeaway from all this is like I'm, I'm, you know, not only is it open source, so I'm pretty public about like what I do with these different projects. Uh, but, but I think it's really valuable to people to like publicly say what you're going to be doing with these projects because you never know how your interests might align with somebody else. Um, you know, and so, and and also like what what someone else can tell you. Like I, I've seen a number of people release open source projects and you know, you, you kind of like whisper to them in back channels, like direct messages or something like that. Like, hey, did you look at this other tool? Cause it does the exact same thing that your tool does. Like you could have saved yourself a month of work, you know? Um, so it has that benefit also, you know, telling people you're publicly and do something helps commit yourself more to it, you know, because it's like, oh, darn, like now everybody knows that I'm gonna do this thing. And so, you know, now I actually have to do it. Um, so it does that, and then and then for me, um, you know, Cloud Mapper has been interesting because I I had plans to work on this, and you know, it aligned with uh, Duo Security's plans as well. They wanted the tool to exist, and so basically, you know, by having some conversations with them, you know, they were like, hey. Uh, you know, we want that tool to exist also. And if you just try and do it on your own, like you're probably not going to get around to actually finishing it, putting it in like a state that is actually going to be usable for other people easily. So, you know, how about, uh, you know, they, they help me out a little bit by, you know, uh, paying me some money in order to do that initial development of it. And then in return, you know, was able to, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, their project that, that they're able to use in their environment. So, you know, that's why, uh, you know, it has their name associated with it and everything as well. So, so, um, so that's that's been like a really uh, useful thing to understand is by by 
telling people publicly that you're going to do something, you never know how your interests might align with somebody else on, on some of these right. things. And is that something you still do? Like if someone wants a specific feature in Cloud Mapper, they can reach out to you and eventually hire you to implement it? So so far, I, I've not had that, unfortunately, but but that is a hope of mine that, you know, by by basically working with, you know, companies that, and, and a lot of times, a lot of the, I mean, really all the functionality in Cloud Mapper over the past like year essentially has been me working with different companies and like they didn't ask me specifically to add this to Cloud Mapper, but you know, in order for me to do it, I had to, you know, write code for it and was able to ask them like, hey, do you mind if, you know, this code that I wrote that's, you know, generally useful to other people if I just, you know, open source that and, you know, so far all the different companies have been cool with it. And so that's, that's how a lot of this different functionality was developed um, was just, you know, by me doing assessment for people or you know any other type of work for them and realizing that I had to write code for it and for me the easiest way to write that code was to add functionality to cloud mapper because it already had a lot of those capabilities in it awesome yeah no that's a really nice way of doing it yeah and you're in the right place for that because you get to see a lot of different AWS environment whereas yeah. most people who write tools uh, and we're in this in this case very much like we have mm -hmm. one specific type of AWS environment so we're going to write tools that solve our problems yep. <laughs> then somebody else will look at it and be like well it doesn't do the one thing I need mm -hmm. uh, then what well you can implement the feature or you end up writing a different tool that's more specific to your environment exactly um, yeah. but the fact that you're seeing so much variety is definitely I think made the tool much yeah. much better yeah that's and, good yeah. and it's given me like those data sets from those companies that i work with you know when i'm developing that new feature because if i you know like i've showed you here where i just have a demo account where you know i only have you know like a couple ec2 instances in it uh, you know it's it's a lot more useful when you can see all these weird cases and things like that from real accounts um you know when you're developing something all right, that's it for this first round, this first installment of the show and tell. Yeah, I know it got dark here. Uh, and um, hopefully you go try out Cloud Mapper, a really awesome tool, especially if you have a lot of accounts and you're trying to implement some sort of test-driven security in your environment and you can write your own rules and uh, visualize a little bit better uh, what is happening inside of your environment. Uh, next, uh, we will be talking to April King about the, uh, the laboratory that uh, you can use to implement content security policy on your website. So stay tuned and see you very soon.